Amen. This morning I have placed myself in a pretty precarious situation by putting a lot more pressure on myself at this point in the service. Um, but to be honest, if I were to show you my notes this morning, you'd understand why. Normally I have maybe three, four pages of notes. I got about eight pages. But that's a lot of information, and there's a reason why God sent me to the pulpit this morning with so much information. I've come to you this morning as God's plowman, plowing in areas of soil that sometimes we don't talk about. God sent me this morning to bring an awareness to the church. As a matter of fact, the title of the message the Lord gave me this morning is The Church Better Wake Up. That's the message God gave me this morning. The church better wake up. Of all the messages that I've preached through the years, every, every once in a while, one message will stand out for me more than any other. For me, that's one of those messages today. There's something about it that really does something in my spirit. If I could put it this way, there's times that I will begin to study or God lays something in my spirit that it almost feels like a gut punch to my spirit. As God begins to reveal something to me that is very important to the church. So that is the reason why that we're fast tracking, if you want to call it that, things this morning. Normally, we may have more singing, more music. Uh, I can guarantee you this. I won't do like Paul did whenever he was preaching for six hours and Eutychus fell out of the window asleep. I won't do that. But I want to make sure I've got ample time and I'm not rushed to share what the Lord put on my heart. Because I've never preached this, and I don't know exactly how long it may take to deliver it, but I do pray this, that you'll stay attentive and that you'll give me the liberty to share what the Lord's put on my heart. Let me ask you a question this morning. If you knew God had moved on your pastor's heart to share something with you, would you want to hear everything that God laid on his heart? Well, that's what I want to do today, and I appreciate your attentiveness. I appreciate your uh, sentiments about that, but I, I want to get into God's Word today. And the text that the Lord led me to is no new text um, it's nothing that we haven't heard preached from before, but I want to show you something maybe in a way we haven't really given much thought to. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 3, and we're going to begin with verse number 1. 2 Timothy, Brother Brian, you got a minute to come up here quickly? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1. I'm going to give you a moment to get there. Yeah. Don't get ahead of me. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. If you got it, say amen. If you'll stand to your feet, if you're physically able. If you can't, we love you the same. There may be parts of the service this morning that may be uncomfortably quiet, but I'm okay with that. Because I want to make sure you understand the gravity of what God's put on my heart. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. How many of you believe this morning that we are living in the last of the last days? You really believe that? For men, men, now don't exclude women, but I point that out this morning because I want you to understand that this is not exclusive to just the church. Just as the Bible did in the Old Testament, you see throughout the Bible that God would deal with entire nations, whether religious or fallen away from religion, or even what we should better call a relationship with God. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, 
Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? It's all about me, myself, and I. Who cares about you? That's the attitude of a lot of people today. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. Boy, that's real, isn't it? You could give some people a million dollars and they'll fuss because you didn't give them a million and one cent. Unholy, without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. You know what that means? There'll be people who hate you for being a Christian. And believe it or not, some that claim to be Christians who hate you because you're trying to live right. Traitors, heady, high-minded, and boy, isn't this the truth, lovers of pleasures, more, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now, this is not the direction of my message, but I do want to point something out about verse number five. It says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Never forget that there's power in godliness, living right. Amen? With the Lord's help today, I want to preach on that subject title that I mentioned, the church, Better Wake Up. Raise your hand to the Lord. Let's begin to pray and ask God to have his way this morning. Father, we just thank you for the privilege to be called the bride. We thank you this morning for all that you've already done within this church service this morning, for your spirit that we feel in this house. We thank you for the people who may be watching or listening online. I pray that everything said and done will only lift you up and point men and women of God closer and point those who are astray back and those who are lost to be converted, and accept you as their Savior. I pray, God, that today that the church will do exactly what I am preaching this morning and wake up. God, allow us to have an awareness because I'm afraid that many have their head buried in the sand. And I pray you'll do this through the name of Jesus. And everyone can say amen. So as I said this morning, I'm coming to you as a church, as a pastor of this church, with a burden. A strong, heavy, intense burden. Because over the course of the direction of the church and the nation that we see over the many years that you, as you see through these many years, uh, how the course has, has been taken, I guess I could put it this way, you see an, a continual progression of moving away from the morality and things of God. Has anyone else seen that? For yourself, you're seeing a, a moving away from the right things, moving toward the wrong things. And some of us may think that we've seen that, but I wonder if we realize just how bad that it is. And anything that I point out to you today is not to glorify sin, but to expose sin. It is not to glorify what the enemy is doing, but it is to expose what the enemy is doing. I don't want God's church or God's people to have their head like an ostrich in the sand and only think they know what's really going on because in the world around us, more immorality is becoming so rampant that we're seeing the church uh, be declining at a breakneck speed and that is also impacting in a Uh, I guess a boomerang effect in the world. So as the church is more affected by the world, the church is less effective in the world. Does that make sense? So I'm just coming to you this morning to let you know what God's laid in my heart in, in regards to this gradual shift and this change and to help us to have that sense of awareness. And this is in line with the very description that Paul wrote to Timothy about so many years ago. This shift, this decline, this change of morality towards things of immorality, this is exactly the very thing that Paul is beginning to describe to this young preacher by the name of Timothy in his letter. 
He is beginning to deal with the things that we have seen continue and continue to see of falling off and falling away in our culture. Things like truth. Has anyone understood that what used to be true is now kind of questionable? A lot of things that were, you know, considered to be an absolute in years in the past. We've got churches that are grappling now over the idea of whether hell's a real place or whether Jesus maybe really walked the earth. I mean, just crazy things that are proven factual things that are beginning to be up for debate and people that are arguing over things that should have been considered truth and maintained as an absolute truth. Not just that, but morality. We're seeing morality on the decline. We're seeing righteousness, right living on the decline. Godliness is on the decline. And a genuine Genuine love for God. I don't know how else to tell you, but all of these other things are a reflection of a person's genuine love for God. If you get right down to the thing and you, you understand that the reason people are where they are and that they have waxed cold in their love, their relationship with God, it all comes back to a person's love. Whether they're deeper in sin, it comes back to their love. It comes back to a heart issue. If you agree with that, can you say amen this morning? And I am not sure what else we could call it but a falling away. We can call it a lot of things, but when people move away from truth, when they move away from morality and righteousness and godliness and a genuine love for God, what else do you call that but a falling away? That's exactly what Paul was writing to Timothy about. If, if you look back to what I read to you there in the scripture, he said that there would be people that were traitors and heavy, uh, heady and high-minded and lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. This is a shift that the church will and will continue to see and it's only going to get worse. Because in these last days, and as I said earlier, I believe that we are in the very last of the last perilous days that he was describing. The thing that Paul was describing was what I said, a shift. But I want you to see, this is a major shift. This is not just Paul talking about the, the immorality that's been around since the fall of Adam. This is a major shift. This is something that is going to climax. And it's going to be an obvious point when things began to go off the rails, if you will. And you see immorality rise to a degree that humanity has never seen before. You see, I didn't live during the Bible days, so I can't talk about the Bible days, but I believe I can prove to you this morning that we are further in the, in the grasp of depravity and illicit uh, things of, of ungodliness than we have ever been before. And I plan to show you that with the Lord's help. It is a turning away from God-centric values. And our nation has seen that. While that there may be people in other cultures and other uh, groups and other you know, organizations and whatnot across the world who that maybe have seen more of these things. As a whole, America has seen a devaluing of God-centric uh, values and principles in this country. As I look around the globe and I see these things, I read what Paul described and what I picture in my mind when I hear what Paul said. I'm a visualist, you know, and I see what in my mind what Paul described. It's like a large structure, a large building. And as it begins to decay, it begins to lean away from its foundation. And while it is leaning away from its foundation, it is also simultaneously leaning towards its own destruction because eventually that building will fall over. And that is what I feel like that I see in my mind that Paul is describing in the text. You see, his description was an obvious shift in things like people views, their values and their priorities do we not see that in 2024 there has been an absolute undeniable shift in people's values in their priorities and in their views about godly things what Paul spoke of is what the church and the world abroad has been seeing for at least the last 24 years, will you say this with me, 24 I want you to keep your finger on that mental note. 
24 years because I want you to see something. How many of you know that if we go back 24 years, where does that put us? That puts us around the year 2000. That is the turn of the, the millennium, if you will, into the 21st century, so to speak. According to the Gallup polls, and the Gallup is a global research group. They have been researching since about 1937, recording research that collects from all over the world. And there are some things that they have shared that is very disturbing to me. So disturbing that last night, my daughter-in-law stayed the night at our house, and I was so disturbed that I got up late, and I knew she was still up, and I began to share some of these things with her. And the reason is because, it, like I said, it was a gut punch to my spirit to know where we really are in America today. Amen. They said, they said that the U.S. church membership, now this does not even go into church attendance. This is dealing with membership. U.S. church membership was at 73% of the U.S. population when the Gallup polls were first measured in 1937. And it remained in that 70 percentile range for the next six decades from the before beginning a steady decline around the turn of the 21st century. So what I want you to see is that right around the year 2000, the church membership was still in the 70th percentile range, which means that 70 out of 100 people were typically members of a church affiliation in 2000. And for 63 years in America, we saw that it remained within that 70th percentile. Sometimes 73%, sometimes 76%. But it remained within that 70 percentile window for 63 years. But something in the year 2000 began to change because after the year 2000, there has been a sharp drop from around 70 to 47 percent, according to the most recent Gallup poll reports in 2020. So we have gone from 70 percent of Americans having a membership affiliation to a religious organization down to only 47 percent. What does that mean to us, Pastor? We're simple minded. Well, to put it in simple terms, most organizations will tell you that any time that a brand or an or a thing falls below the 50th percentile that it that it represents a thing whether we say we're Pentecostal well if 50 more than 50 percent of the church by and large becomes not Pentecostal we can no longer call ourselves Pentecostal that is a held view amongst most in uh, most all groups uh, and yet here we are in America with only 47 percent and that doesn't tell you exactly how many of those people People who claim to be members are actually going to church, who are actually faithful to the things of God. Does everybody see where I'm going this morning? You see, there's two things worth considering from all of this that the Spirit of God showed me. Number one, first, there was very little change in this country for 63 years. What are you telling me, Pastor? This tells me that for 63 years that there was a maintaining, there was a level that that was consistent for 63 years. Something changed though. The second thing it tells me is that there is an, an undeniable trend in this country away from God and an active participation in the kingdom work of, uh, on earth. You see, most stats place the number of American people that have left the church in the last 24 years at somewhere around 40 million young people. Did anyone catch that? That in the last 24 years, that over 40 million people have left, since left, having any affiliation with the church. Somebody say, God help us. Amen. Renowned secular commentators on spec are speculating that this only proves uh, that there has been a cultural shift in this country and the ch church is no longer a priority to the majority of Americans. Does anybody else see a problem with that at all? I mean, after all, the church is God's bride and God instituted the church. And if churches weren't important, tell me the reason why that God gave 
gave us pastors after God's own heart. Tell me the reason why we need elders in the church or deacons. Tell me the reason why that we need the Holy Ghost to come together, that men of God can agree together, work together, labor together, and embark on missionary work together. Say man, somebody. We need the church, and yet so many are saying away with the church. Who cares? That Gallup went on to say, in conclusion, after all was said and done, the bottom line is this. On any given weekend, about three in 10 U.S. adults attend religious services, which is down from 42% two decades ago. Based on this trend, this is what the researchers have to say. Based on this trend, church attendance will continue to likely decline, steadily decline in the future given the fact that younger Americans have a weaker attachment to any religious affiliation. That's talking about my children and your grandchildren. That means our babies are growing up in a mess. Oh God help. One disturbing aspect that many are overlooking and I don't want you to miss this is the fact that oh, the older generation, hang on to your seatbelt here. Sister Margaret, that includes the saints of God like you and Sister Linda. Probably saints like Sister, uh, uh, like Sister Pat over here and Sister Nora. This older generation born between the years 1928 and 1964 are the ones which make up the majority of that 47% still holding on. Did everyone catch that? Now do you understand why I get excited when young people try to serve the Lord? Now do you understand why I try to promote and get behind somebody who really shows an interest to work for God? I'm telling you the reason is is because of just what I'm telling you this morning. So what exactly am I saying? Unless we as the church have a massive wave of conversions of people that were born after 1965, the church is going to have be in even worse shape when the older saints of that 47% start dying off. Where in the world will the church be if we've got no newcomers coming in? Amen. Of those that were born after 1965 who now say we don't want anything to do with God, I'm telling you, the church will be in trouble. I'm gonna tell you something. God's always gonna have a church. He made that clear to Elijah when he said, I got 7,000, have not bowed a knee to Baal. But that also stands to support and reason when the scripture said that many are called and few are chosen. That straight is the gate. And narrow is the way. And how many? Few be. Oh God, I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. Few. Somehow or another we got this idea that rock star smoking crack, Hollywood actors in, engaging in illicit things, singing all kind of ungodly music are all going to heaven. But straight is the gate and narrow is the way. And there's a lot of people and a lot of folks in this generation that are going to lead a lot of our young people, our children and grandchildren straight into the flames of hell fire. Somebody say help us all. So while we have people in this generation that will get mad whenever people like myself preach things like this, they get all stirred up and worked up over stuff like this, claiming, well, wait a minute now, pastor. It's always been like that. There's always been immorality. There's always been, you know, sexual perversion and things of that nature. And so there's nothing to concern yourself with. Why are you getting so worked up over all of this? Let me tell every one of those who may say something about what I'm preaching. You hear me loud and clear. The proof far outweighs that false narrative you can keep on preaching that saying that, claiming that, standing on that but it just is not true the proof as granny used to say is in the pudding am I right? all of this leads us to ask ourselves some really important questions what has gone so wrong in these last 
20 or 24 years that was so right in the previous 63. As I sat up late last night with the Spirit of God leading me in study and meditation on the Spirit and the Word, I have to ask my own self, as a pastor, as a leader, what was so right for 63 years and so wrong for the last 24? I had to know. I had to know what has changed in the last 24 years. What significant major world events have changed and caused people to go astray at such a breakneck speed? Well, the answer to that, and I understand, you know, I believe this morning the answer to that and to understand how we got here, we've, we first have to look at the church. For us to be able to know how we got here and to know why this is happening, we first, this is biblical, have to look at the church. Because there's no doubt in my mind and most of you that the church itself could have done a better job. Huh? After all, we have watched through the years some of the most well-known preachers and ministries and organizations fall into the snare of scandals and sexual immorality. Have we not? It has caused many to lose confidence in what was supposed to be the men and women of God. The church of the past was play, had placed great emphasis on things like devotion, righteousness, and denial of self. That's what the church of yesterday for 63 years stood on, denying self. Whenever you become saved and born again, it's not about what I want. It's, not, it's about what God wants. But you see, there's been a shift. And I want you to see, but that has been replaced uh, by many churches and groups with this new casual social club church experience, which places little to no emphasis on the personal sacrificial elements of things like prayer and fasting. We don't see the strong emphasis. Do you remember that years gone by that prayer meetings were a staple in our churches? Yet today we can't even hardly get people to show up for spaghetti dinner, let alone a prayer meeting. How do you know I've pastored for a while? I can tell you, something has shifted and changed and it is not a good sign. Things like abstinence from fleshly vices that lead to addiction, the church stood strong against. Now the church of today has replaced that with a neutral stance on the spiritual and fleshly vices. The church of yesterday would place emphasis on hiding God's word in our heart that we might not sin against him. While the church of today says it's all right, God loves you and he understands. As if that the lamb will not one day be the lion in the day of judgment. <laughs> I want you to know that this is not something to joke around about, play around about. This is very serious. So we have come to a day where church leaders are now doing what many sinners would not have dared to do 50 years ago. We are watching people today within the church who do things that 50 years ago sinners would have balked at. You gotta be kidding me. I would never be caught doing that. And yet today, some of our churches are eating it up hook, line, and sinker. What I'm about to share with you, though, I want you to first understand that this is my strong personal opinion. That can be argued. But my strong personal opinion is based on my personal experience and what I have seen for these last 24 to 25 years of my ministry. While the church should and can do a better job I want you to see the greatest failure of all rest on the shoulders of the people of an entire nation as a whole. Is that biblical? Oh, yes, it is. Because all throughout the Old Testament, when God would deal with sin, most times he would deal with the entire nation, the whole nation. 
As a matter of fact, God deals with groups at large often. Not that we're not going to face God, God's judgment as an individual person, but I want you to understand how God sees an entire nation. Look at the way he saw entire churches in the book of Revelation. He said, there were some among you that are worthy and will walk with me in white. But he was saying the majority of you are bent and bound to go to hell. That's what he was trying to portray and convey to them. I am telling you this morning that God's got a bride. And there will be people that are going to make it. But we are watching a steady decline that ought to concern every child of God. The greatest failure of all rests on the shoulders of an entire nation. Those who have allowed their priorities to fail as their love for God has done exactly what the Bible said and grown cold. This is in line with what Paul said, and and we read what he said there in 2 Timothy 3 and 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men for men he didn't say the church yeah the church is included but when he said for men he was talking about the entire uh, culture the entire organization of mankind within a nation he was talking about the whole of humanity he said for men shall be lovers of their own selves do you know what you do when you stop loving God You love something else. You love self. Do you know what happens when you get saved? You stop loving self like you used to and you start loving God. That does not mean you have no self-worth or no self-value. You just understand that your value doesn't rest in how good I am. Huh? That's true, Pastor Myers. Because the Bible says that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, and you know what he said. But I want to show you something. Continuing to look at these last 24. I told you to put your finger on 24. Looking at these last 24 years and what is so different than the former 63. If you want to know where we are in our current culture, let me show you a few things that may disturb you like they did me. The Public Religion Research Institute stated that the most recent polls reveal approximately 60% of Americans under the age of 30 years old have left the church because of the church's position on LGBTQ issues. 60% of our youth don't tell me that modern culture has not influenced our kids. Don't tell me that the previous 63 years worth of saints got it all wrong and all of a sudden we all got it right. Come on now. This one statistic disturbed me and gave me a little bit of insight. I'm going to show you why. It is revealing because around the year 2000 was when we began to see the sexuality and gender confusion really gaining traction in America. Before then, it was an odd thing. Yeah, there were people practicing different things behind the scenes. But it wasn't celebrated. It wasn't enamorized. It wasn't popular. It wasn't in every single television program. Does anybody get disgusted when you watch a television program and you think, why do they got to, I mean, it only represents like 4% of the population. But now it's got got to be politically correct. And you got to have a homosexual couple in every single program you watch nowadays. I don't really want to see two dudes kissing on screen. You know what I'm saying? Makes me sick to my guts. Some of you say, Pastor Myers, and all sin. Yes, all sin should disgust us. But I'm not going to sit there and overlook the fact that something has changed. And if we sit by idly and act like it ain't no big deal, we as a church are in trouble. I'm going to prove it to you. You see, continuing down this slope of immorality, Around 2010, in the realm of government and politics, support of same-sex marriage surpassed the opposition to it. So before 2010, there were more people in the political and government scope who were opposed to it. But something happened in 2010, and now it's all of a sudden we got more in favor than those that were not in favor of it. What happened after 2010? I'm glad you asked. Eventually, in 2015, the Supreme Court ruled that same-sex couples have the right to marry. 
Now, you may be sitting here and say, but pastor, what is wrong with that? Let me ask you a question. What would be the problem with any or morality? Should we pass laws that it's okay for an aunt to marry their nephew? Should we pass laws that it's okay for a 42-year-old man to marry a 12-year-old girl? It's immorality. Who is the one that defines immorality? Do you know what immorality is? It is that ungodly, wild nature. What separates humanity from animals? Morality. Why are we different? You don't see, it's no, no thing for two dogs to get tangled up. They don't really care what sex they are. They're wild animals. We're not wild animals. We are the created beings, God's best creation. There should be a level of morality among people. Well, if you can just love anybody you love, I guess that means that you can be like 38 and a school teacher and you can, you can uh, get hooked up with somebody, some mama's 17-year-old son. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, what we are doing is we're blurring the lines until we're open up a big can of worms. Come on, somebody. Now, I hope I don't get a strike or uh, get shut down over this, but I'm gonna tell you something. As long as God gives me the ability, I'm gonna keep on proclaiming the truth. I don't mean to hurt nobody's feelings. I love people no matter what they are. Black, brown, raggedy green. I don't care what color you are. It doesn't matter what background you're from. It doesn't matter if me, to me if you're addicted to one thing or the other thing or if you're gay, homosexual, or what you are. But I'm going to tell you, sin is sin. And if the church does not declare it is sin, we're going to be in bad shape. Come on now. What, the, what other major developments have we seen in the last 24 years? Are you guys along for the ride for this? It's going to get a little bit sticky. The last 24 years... Uh, we, have, we have seen a swinging or a, uh, we've seen a pendulum, if you will, swinging in the wrong direction. The first thing that we see happening of major developments in the last 24 years, the first smartphones with web browsing capabilities were rela- released in early 2002. And the first iPhone was released in 2007. I'm going to show you something. Shortly thereafter, Facebook came on the scene in 2004. YouTube launched its platform in 2005. Twitter joined the social party in 2006. And now, along with many others I could mention, this one really disturbs me. One of the most recent developments and platforms that has taken the internet by storm is a a group or a platform known as OnlyFans. And if you've been on it, please take recognition of what I'm about to show you. Originally, it was designed as a platform for creators like stars to connect with their fan base, for people to be able to connect with the ones who followed them that they were so out of touch with. But unfortunately, it quickly became known for its ability to share adult content with everyday ordinary teachers, nurses, doctors, college students, moms and people from all races and backgrounds becoming uh, solicitors and promoters and creators of illicit content. We got moms walking into their bathroom or their home, married women who are sharing illicit photos of themselves and selling them for subscription online. You don't see nothing wrong with that. We're talking, some of you don't even realize these things are happening, but it gets worse. Sharing the most intimate and risque content to those willing to pay a monthly subscription fee. Under great scrutiny, this group OnlyFans declared it would restrict the ability to share adult content in 2021. But after backlash from users and content creators, it chose to reverse that position. You know why it reversed the position? Money. Yeah, you guessed it. So, when I began to study a little bit, I wish I could give it all, but I'm going to minimize this for you, okay? Its owner, a man by the name of Leonid Ravinsky, has seen such financial success with this predominantly perverted platform that in the year 2022, he paid himself over $1 million a day for 260 days as forms of bonuses which was on top of his regular salary. 
two, you're 260, 60 million dollars on top of his annual salary. Somebody say, whoa, that is disturbing. That same year, the company's net revenue was $377.5 billion with a B. As for the creators of themselves, the people, the moms, and some of these college students, the average age, by the way, is about 29 years old for a content creator on OnlyFans. And be uh, safeguarded to know that Pastor Myers was careful in my research. Right, Sister Miranda? The average age is about 29 years old. The most common user, you guessed it, are males. That's right. But that didn't exclude females. Because during the COVID pandemic, it, there was a spike in users. And guess what happened? Suddenly, now we've got more adult men content creators, and now we've got women that are buying into this mess hook, line, and sinker too. How do you think that's going to affect marriages? How do you think that affects society? I told you earlier they were under scrutiny, and they almost changed their rules in 2021. You know why? Because we had kids going to school finding out they're finding their teacher on OnlyFans. We had people that were showing up to a real estate deal and finding out their real estate agent was on OnlyFans. Husbands finding out their wives have been selling stuff on OnlyFans. And wives finding out their husbands were on OnlyFans. People getting random charges on their cards trying to wonder what in the world is going on only to find out that their husband has been doing things they shouldn't be doing. Say amen, somebody. As for the creators themselves, that people actually doing this, why are they doing it? Let me share with you the reason why many are doing it. Their annual income ranged from 140000 to $5.4 million a year for selling pictures and videos of themselves. Feeding the depravity of human lust and sexual immorality. It is estimated that there are over 500,000 new users to that one platform every single day. 500,000 new users every day. How else have smartphones and the world of internet affected us the last 24 years? Glad you ask. There is no way. We've talked about it, danced around it a little bit. There's no way that we could ignore how the availability of pornography has affected the world as we just saw with sites just as OnlyFans. Between 2000 and 2004, with faster internet speeds along with the new technology of smartphones, the popularity of porn sites absolutely exploded. That's right as it now allowed viewers to anonymously watch illicit content as much and as often as they chose. They didn't have to wait to find a friend's centerfold. They didn't have to go to the store to buy a magazine to look at whatever content. Now they could do it while at work. And as a matter of fact, one site said that there were millions of users. I think it was 28 million users, if memory serves me right, every day watching porn from work. And during that time frame, with advertisers paying big money for screen time, it was now free for the curious minds of the whole world to indulge in. Is anybody else disturbed? Let me give you some statistics that might surprise you. And to just the available availability of pornography and how it has impacted our culture. I told you we need to look at big changes in the last 24 years. And I'm not telling you pornography is all the reason why people are pulling out of church. I'm just showing you that awareness. We need to get our head out of the sand and the church better wake up. One in five kids ages 10 and 7 through 17 are regular users of internet pornography. Anybody got any 10-year-olds? Anybody got any 10-year-old nieces or nephews? 16, 17-year-old kids in your family? There are one in five, 
Think of this. Five kids in a youth program in a church. Imagine one in every five. Imagine you got 50 kids and one in five are regular users of pornography at 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old. Somebody see a problem with that? 73% of teens ages 13 to 17 have watched pornography with the average age of first time exposure being somewhere between 11 and 12 years old. Most likely due to many of the years of exposure. I want you to see something. Most likely due to the many years of exposure to sexual content in TV, video games, Hollywood, along with so many immoral shifts in our culture. Listen to this statistic. 90% of teens and 96% of young adults say they see absolutely nothing wrong with porn while just 55% of adults 25 and older say they believe porn is wrong. That's the culture we're in. Pornographic websites. You ready for this? Pornographic websites make up only 4% of all internet websites. 4%. All the global websites in the world, only 4%. But don't let that fool you. You ready for this? Of that 4%, today's porn sites receive more website traffic in the United States than Facebook, Twitter, Netflix, Instagram, Pinterest, and LinkedIn combined. Boy, it's awful quiet in here this morning. Combined. I know people that live on Facebook. I know people that live on these sites. And you're telling me that there's more traffic on pornography sites than all of those sites, that 4%, than all of those sites combined? That's pretty bad news. Just one, just one of the major porn sites alone reports an average of 80,000 views or visits per minute. One, just one of the major players. That same porn site had over 2.14 2 billion views during a single month in 2023. That was more than Netflix, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest combined in that same month. An anti-porn research group by the name of Barna Group and Covenant Eyes reported in 2020 that 33% of women aged 25 and under search for porn at least once per month. That's just men doing it, Pastor Myers. I told you there's been a shift. Now, I don't want to be funny it may seem comical, but it's really not funny. My daughter-in-law and I were talking about it last night. I said, it sure makes you look at things a lot different, don't it? Because it makes you start looking around like, one in how many did he say? How many people we got in this room? How many sisters in, that, in our church? I wonder, I wonder if she's doing that. Huh? I believe that a conservative people have stronger values. But don't sit here and fool yourself and don't think for one minute that this thing that nobody wants to talk about, your pastor's talking about it this morning because God assigned me to talk about it. And I'm going to tell you something. We better wake up. We better wake up. Here's what some people, the way some people look at it. But wait a minute, pastor. You know, the unconverted people are the ones guilty of that. So just... Just keep it to yourself. That's the loss. That's the world out there doing that. You keep thinking that. Because the same stats reveal that an average of 50% of pastors have viewed porn off and on. Does that disturb any of you? 
50 and 100. Five out of 10. It goes on to tell us that one in five youth pastors and one in seven senior pastors are reported to use porn on a regular basis and are currently struggling. One in five youth pastors and one in seven senior pastors are reported to use porn on a regular basis and are currently struggling. That equates, so, if you, so you understand how serious that is, that equates to more than 50,000 U.S. church leaders, church leaders, church leaders, not government officials, not teachers, not just firefighters and police officers and church leaders. Over 50,000 U.S. church leaders are regular visitors to porn sites. Probably some of the same ones getting up preaching against homosexuality and every other kind of thing. Aside from ministry, it is also reported that a whopping 63% of professing Christian men are watching porn along with 16% of professing Christian women. I don't know, folks. These things just really hit me in the gut. Because if we keep burying our head in the sand, we're going to think all is well. It ain't well. Something's happened in these last 24 years to get us where we're at today, and it's a mess. Think of this. If a hundred women were in one church setting, imagine looking around thinking to yourself that 16 of these women have viewed and searched for pornography last month. Imagine thinking that. Tell me that's not crazy. Imagine being in a group of 100 men and looking around the room and realizing that more than half, 63% of professing Christian men don't look now. It might be your husband. Don't look now. It might be your dad or your brother or your son. My God. Somebody say, God, help us. There's a few things that all of this tells us. And I want you to see, as the Spirit began to reveal to me, there has been an increase in the manufacture and the availability of sinful vices and people's willingness to partake of it as this, this is driving the nation into a deeper place of immoral de depravity. I told you before that I will prove to you that this nation has more availability to indulge itself in illicit things than it ever has before. Imagine what links that a wife struggling with loneliness or something going on in her marriage would have had to have gone through years ago to view pornography. While now they can be sitting in the restroom trying to get away from the kids and something pop on the phone and the next thing you know they're looking at full-blown pornography. Imagine the links that a child, 10 or 12 years old, would have had to go through to see some illicit material versus today where moms and dads leave them with the phone, don't put any restrictions on them and let them have full internet access and they can sit all day long or in their bedroom. Let me tell you, you say my kid would never do that, but let me tell you, you might be wrong. I'm gonna tell you something, this culture shift has it affected a great majority of the positions people have on sin. They've had to move the boundaries more and more and more and more. 